the Excel site on a top end as well, but I know that I'm always interested in this gameplay world because uh, even though I don't always play the video games, like I said, I'm usually doing the uh, more simpler games like Words with Friends and stuff like that, but I do love the games and my nephews and my younger brother are very much into that gaming world, so definitely always uh, glad to see what's going on and I'm interested in hearing what Jatobi got to tell us about the gaming world. So let's welcome Jatobi and uh, Julia uh, on our gamer couch. And good morning, <laughs> welcome to Game with Ben. I think good afternoon to uh, America. <laughs> <laughs> How's everything doing on your side of the world? It's all well, all good. Uh, we just uh, released out our uh, highest uh, COVID cases yesterday. So things are like, you know what, what happened. I mean, uh, we had like 80,000 plus cases recorded uh, every day now. So that's what uh, the situation. But everything is open up, economy is open up, uh, there are no schools, uh, no theatres, and no sports even, but uh, otherwise everything is open up now, so people are taking precautions, but still uh, it's difficult to control 1.3 billion people, that's why we have a lot of cases going around. But I'll tell you uh, an important uh, news about uh, gaming, uh, but I would like to welcome our uh, special guest today, uh, Jim Mayer on uh, IGM TV's Game of Ten. Hi Jim, good, good morning to Jim actually. We all are in the afternoon, but Jim is still in the uh, morning mode. Yes. And so, Jim, I, I, you, I can't uh, call from Papi, yeah. <laughs> I had to already this morning. Uh, so, so that's what it is. It's, it's 10.33 uh, p.m. India time. So, uh, the news is that Jatobi is Julian, uh, and uh, especially that, uh, do you think that a, a big game like PUBG can, uh, can bring the economy down? I mean, it depends, I suppose, on um, who plays the game and like how. Can you give more details? But PUBG is one of the, but Julian, PUBG is one of the popular games around. I mean, around the world, and then I think uh, PUBG also is one of the uh, most downloaded games so far. I'm not sure Jatobi has the number, but uh, what happened is that uh, because of uh, what's happening with China and other things, uh, Indian government decided to ban PUBG, uh, which is being uh, produced from China, like TikTok and other things. And because of the ban, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, government to government and uh, diplomatic talks going around. And they are, uh, I mean, uh, they are fighting against the ban happening in India because we are 1.3 billion people and they have a lot of uh, followers from India. And, uh, I mean, there is some kind of a discussion going on uh, on the on the government level about uh, the games and other apps because we have uh, banned like under around 100 plus apps from China uh, since a uh, couple of months. And uh, according to the numbers, uh, the uh, company's uh, profit and uh, downloads and hits are going tremendously down, uh, I mean, uh, as compared to what they have in other countries. And, uh, I mean, I don't know uh, about the profit or about the economy structure about, or maybe a gaming industry in China, but uh, definitely it's had a hard impact because of what uh, we uh, bring to the table, uh, 1.3 billion people. So I just wanted to know what's your thought on that. Uh, uh, the first thing it makes me think of is the licensing that's been associated with the Tetris game history. So whenever the Tetris game first came out, it was actually created. It emerged from uh, Soviet Russia in a computer lab where the programmers were actually just developing games for their own entertainment. And they weren't really allowed to sell these things because that was kind of, you know, a, a capitalistic uh, frame of mind. But as time went on, eventually the game got so popular that people began trying to purchase it. And so, you know, of course, there are these different economic and legal factors between different countries. By the time the government got involved with the Tetris game, there were already licensing deals that were taking place with members of other nations. So in many ways, it was uh, an issue, you know, uh, Soviet Russia with, uh, with that game. So this is, I'm not too familiar with PUBG specifically. Myself, I've always played Fortnite a bit more. But, you know, it goes without saying that these sorts of things definitely do have a history in the different, uh, you know, economic systems that produce these games will ultimately clash and the players, you know, play them around the world. Hey, Jatobi, that actually raises an interesting question to me and everything. How is um, the game industry doing here in America in terms of even survival? When we're talking about games that we want to see people playing and games that we know are getting interest, but I know that even like here in uh, North Carolina, throughout the U.S., bars and other aspects of the entertainment industry are being heavily hit. So, you know, but I also know that sometimes they talk about things that are recession proof. So, is the gaming industry one of those industries that is recession proof, or is it being impacted as well? Uh, 
it is and it isn't. So, for example, with PUBG, PUBG actually was the leading Battle Royale game for a long time. The problem was is Fortnite took that over uh, late last year, as a matter of fact. It, uh, Fortnite just went on a tear and has, you know, never looked back. Uh, PUBG, yes, has a huge, huge, huge player base and still tons of people play it. There's actually a funny... Um, youtube group that uh well there's a youtube group that does funny videos spoofing you know fortnite PUBG, and all of them um but needless to say yes PUBG, I, I it, it at this moment is just another battle royale hate to say it that way but that's the way it is um but in terms of the industry being recession proof it is and it isn't because it is in a sense that you have to i've got a visitor by the way uh, it is in the sense that you have to uh, have developers. Those developers can't work together as easily as they can on the inside of, you know, inside, a, inside of a company. Um, but it isn't, and it's recession proof in the sense that what else are kids going to be doing on a regular basis yeah. if they can't go outside, if they, and they can't socialize with their friends, where do they socialize? Roblox, Minecraft, fi uh, uh, Fortnite, any social platform there is so yes uh it in a sense it is because tons of people yeah. are playing games and tons of people are going to yeah. download games yeah, yeah. <laughs> Silly. and tons of people are going to just sit there and watch games and watch twitch and watch youtube uh and watch uh if uh tiktok because tiktok has a gaming section um but games are huge and they're not going anywhere. They're only growing. The tough part is, again, the development side, the production side, all that. That's where the recession actually hurts. important to point out as well so the accessibility whenever it comes to coding people would often think as long as you have access to the technology necessary to get into coding that it would be easy to break into that field of study but in fact it's not necessarily the case people might not realize that just because you have these machines that you know that they have what it takes to just care to just code and that it would be understandable so i think that the accessibility of learning how to code is very different from the accessibility of what it would take to code and what the person knows that they could do it. And I think that uh, there aren't enough influences in certain communities to encourage people to get into coding. In some senses, it's almost stereotyped as being uh, affiliated with, I guess you could say, the gated communities of Silicon Valley, things that might not be you know, as privy to people of lower socioeconomic standing per se. But nonetheless, these things do serve as some of the key motivating factors for people from those backgrounds to get into this. And I'm sure Anki can acknowledge that as well. I'm sure technology is a huge uh, social force and it's a source of social mobility in India as well. Totally. I had a word with a lot of people in different domains around India, especially uh, out in India as well. And a lot of people who live alone or maybe uh, who have the job uh, where they don't have to work physically with their hands, they use to either sing song or play games. Because that's the past time they have. I mean, they don't want to watch movies or they don't want to watch the news, basically. Maybe that just happened maybe 15 or even. But most of the time goes to games or TikTok or things like that, which is more engaging. And games is something which is more engaging. And a lot of people don't watch movies. They just want to go play games. So if you get a chance or if you ask people or if you ask students, basically, that what are the four best things they want? I think they just want to play games. That's about it. Yeah. 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 some uh, probably hopefully new listeners that are watching and I never ask you this question but definitely share with folks what got you into gaming like I said I know that you have a gaming company I've known you for being a co-MC and for your involvement with the uh, Durham Bulls but just what got you into gaming and then I'm going to turn it over to the question that Jim may have as well 
Um, just like everybody. I was a kid. It was fun. Uh, I still play games now. I mean, every it when I was growing up, the I was playing the RCA system, which was basically a big keypad um, where you'd push uh, the number keys and it would send characters different directions. Then you had programming, a little bit of programming stuff with the TRS-80, uh, sending the turtle around. I mean, all these little things, though, that's what got me into gaming was it, it was just fun. Um, I enjoyed, Jim, you'd like this, I did enjoy chess. I played, uh, my favorite was go rather than chess though because i enjoyed uh when i went on a um habitat for humanities trip uh we were building the we were trying to rebuild these the, the hurricane the homes from i think it was hurricane andrew or something uh down in miami um and at one or one of the nights a individual introduced me to go so i sat there and played that and it was like a, it i just enjoy games it's fun it's a challenge um Rather than, uh, yeah, like Ankin's talk, Ankin was talking about, uh, rather than going to watch a movie, it's much more fun to me, uh, unless it's a great movie, of course, but it's much more fun to me to sit there and interact and be a part of it, um, and control what happens. There's one of my favorite games called Detroit. Detroit is a very, uh, it is a true choose your own adventure type game. Um, and it's, it's not action oriented or action packed where you have to click and hit buttons to do particular things. It's mainly, okay, what would you like your character to do? And if your character chooses X, you get to see the outcome of what happens. And there's no good or bad answer because everything has consequences. And so it's kind of like a life lessons. It, 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 it's neat. Um, same thing with all the strategy games. There was a game on the Sega uh, Genesis called uh, Tyrant. One of the hardest games I've ever played. Uh, it was before Civilization, well, came around when Civilization originally came around with. And oh my goodness, you had to go through different ages of, uh, or different uh, 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 periods of, of history and you had to take your cavemen and then have them evolve and become, uh, you know, the next, uh, working, building the Greek Coliseum and, you know, defenses. I mean, you just kept going through life and it, you were playing against different, uh, opponents. They were all computer oriented or computer generated because, you know, back with Sega Genesis, they didn't have, you know, the internet or the network set up, but yeah, you would, go through and uh if, if you were if you were stuck in the caveman period and the computer was already at the ancient greek <laughs> empire and they came to attack you you were in trouble but you know it, it's just the challenge the fun of just bi uh, of the game is what always drew me into it and it still takes me there huh <laughs> but uh, before I get to the question, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about my uh, association with gaming. And, you know, if it had a board, I was in. You know, it could be Candyland, it could be chess, it could be Go. It didn't matter. I just liked playing games. And when I was a senior systems programmer responsible for the trading system at Schwab, which was the most important uh, system, you know, there, when it was working, there wasn't that much for me to do, so I would switch screens to Tetris. And I was playing Tetris, and when my boss was in the area, I would switch back to my systems programmer screen. So that's that's how I got into it. But my question was, um, is there a UN commission about this? Because you guys were talking about um, China saying, uh, you know, I, you, you can have access to this or not. And the U.S. is saying, hey, you can't, you can't play TikTok anymore in the U.S. because it's from China. Right? And all this stuff seems to me that we need a global solution. And I wonder if there is anything in the U.N. now addressing this. Or will it be country to country fighting over intellectual property rights? That, from what I gather, um, and that's why I asked, uh-oh, uh Ankin, you're on, you're on mute. 
But uh, from what I what I'd gather, like with Tencent, that's why I asked. Uh, I remember we had we talked to um, uh, who was it prior? I cannot remember. Uh, I forgot his name. I apologize. But uh, Tencent, yes, Tencent was going to be uh, they own TikTok, and when they were going to ban TikTok, that's what yeah, worried yeah. all the gamers yeah, yeah. because Fortnite is oh. partially owned by TikTok. Uh, or owned by the Tencent because Tencent puts the money into Epic. So Epic's the, all the money that Epic has is you know partially owned by Tencent. So that was a big problem for for uh, a, the whole gaming community. And regionally, they do like movies more so than movies and music and other forms of I guess communication, art, and entertainment. Uh, that's the only governing body that separates the games. Because there are particular games that you can have in China, but you cannot have in the U.S. There are particular games you can have in Japan, but you can't have in Germany. It's all in that governing body telling that... Uh, I, Wolfenstein is a great example. Wolfenstein, uh, because of the media or the content that was in the game, it was banned in particular countries because those countries did not want that media there. Because it depicted the country in a particular light, and they did not want that. Um, outside of that, there's no real global governing body per se, like you're talking about at the UN. Uh, it's mainly just a, a, a regional and a country based system. And do you think it would be appropriate for the UN to have a commission governing this or at yeah. least getting countries talking to each other? Be, I, I think it's always a good thing to have a global system, uh, that, uh, some type of global market that's because gaming is global it, it it really is and we've got to have some type of agreement uh, on what is right uh, what can be because if there was a uh, there were games in uh in uh, in japan that were dealing with rape um and of course that game those games never came to the u.s uh because the u.s didn't want that but we have to figure out a way to make that a global market because those games still came because people still downloaded those games in the back in a, yeah. a uh, you know, a LimeWire and all the other stuff. So, right. so it'd be nice to have a global system for a, a, a global product because that's what video games are. But also then you begin to micromanage. Right. Then, you know, you don't want to introduce another layer of bureaucracy. You got it. You yeah. got it. There's the ES. Like that. There's already the ERSRB uh, in the U.S. That started way back when. When it actually people get it confused. People assume that it started because of Mortal Kombat, but it wasn't. It was actually because of a game called Night Trap. Night Trap came out on the Sega CD. It was one of the first games written for the Sega C or released for the Sega CD when it came out. Um, that game, the whole purpose of the game is you were a security guard per se, but you were watching this house, this house, uh, this house party. And in this house party, the kids were having fun. And then these guys were trying to sneak in and abduct these children. You had to protect these kids and people really got upset about it. Um, the ESRB was created after that. And so now you have the M ratings, the, the, you know, uh, the G ratings, just all the ratings. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's where the ESRB came from, and that's the rating system that's there now. And Julian, what do you think? Do you think that there should be some sort of layer of bureaucracy over this governing, so that countries can all be one globe, gaming wise? So it's a really it goes a lot deeper than just the gaming itself, because if there was something like that on the games, it would almost have to apply also to other cultural artifacts, right? And in some ways, there are certain customs that can be different between different nations to where ultimately it could even restrict some creative freedom, or maybe it could expand it, but I think that what would be better would be for each individual nation to have their own kind of ESRB and then to just let the market determine which games you know should be uh, contrasted and compared with that. I think that having a United Nations layer of bureaucracy over it wouldn't necessarily contribute too much to it, but wouldn't you know, hurt either if there was uh, more need. I don't see much need at the moment, though. 
Because once you do your trade to some degree of like almost like a prohibition era kind of thing happening. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I think I agree with Jadoji. Uh, so sorry, Julian, that uh, I mean uh, we don't require any kind of. Uh, I mean, we must have an association. That's fine because there are a lot of associations uh, about gaming, and they are working on uh, how to develop and empower game or creating a gaming industry worldwide, which is acceptable because, like entertainment industry, there is no yeah, actual yeah. gaming industry. It's still the, it's still not uh, term as an industry uh, in the world right now. But why, uh, Jim, is that uh, because see, every country has their own IP. And uh, when we can't, uh, when we can't have those IPs in different countries like China and all those things, you know that I mean it's not uh, you can't use Google in China. I mean right. the Gmail is not working. So if we have that those kind of things, and then if you start uh, talking about games, and then uh, those games will be a world-based uh, organization, and then uh, you want uh, to play those games in different countries, and then the countries have their own restrictions. And also with gaming, what happens is that uh, our country is a peaceful religious country. And we avoid a lot of game which is more of a violent game. Yeah, but that 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 that
if you want particular things or uh, unless you're going to have to ext- play years and years to level up to get the one particular thing that you've been battling for since the game came out. So th- it's it, it's more nuanced than just a uh, top down is bad. No, uh, bottom up is all we want. Yes. So it's a lot more nuanced than that. So I think it just has to be a partnership on both ends of how to make it work. Because I think um, if you take uh, another prime example of, uh, of two games, two games that came out and had two different trajectories, but they started in the same market. You have League of Legends and Heroes of the Storm. They, were made, they, they have some of the same programmers in both of them. The problem with Heroes of the Storm, it added in it, it added in a bunch of loot boxes, and you have to do all these trials and everything else, and you have to take forever to unlock characters. Well, League of Legends, you pretty much get everybody. League of Legends is the number is the number one, number two, right there with Dota two, uh, Dota two, being in terms of esports games out there. Heroes of the Storm is on its last leg and barely receiving updates. Even though Heroes of the Storm is such a great game, but you, I think had it had that same that same mindset and figured out some way that League of Legends and Defenders of the Arena did, or uh, Defenders of the Ancients did, or Dota Two did, it would have been right along with them. But again, it's it's it, it's tough to say that it's either this way or that way. Where I think it's a lot more nuanced and a lot more. try and figure out what is worth legislating if there was going to be a kind of unified rule system for something like this. Uh, part of the reason it would be hard is because of the fact that we might have different opinions of what the benefit of playing a video game actually is. And I think that we would have to decide upon what the benefits really are if we wanted to start being official in our you know, attempts to use these things for the betterment of society. For instance, whenever we think about games and gamification of things that can be used as learning tools, well, uh, then that seems like something that almost does merit a kind of centralized governing body. But then there are still those, you know, different idiosyncrasies uh, in different countries and things sure. that you know, one yeah. area might want to be taught over another and things like that. So what, are, what do you guys think are the benefits? For instance, if uh, this was to be directed by an official process, what do you think we could gain as opposed to letting it just be a kind of bottom-up approach where, you know, the small guys ultimately just decide the landscape? Well, my, my first instinct is to say, you know, like, what is the consumer protection? That that that, that would be one layer that I think is uh, important to have. For example, what if I don't know the difference between a game that has a loot box and one that doesn't? Uh, so it, can there be some mechanism for saying, hey, you know, download this but there's a loot box uh and you know if it if i can hide it then is the consumer protected that would be my question and that's where i think that governing body would have to come into play i mean there is again there the the delineate the delineations are free and free to play however even in some free games there's still a play a pay-to-play system that's in 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 place um and that's that's where the whole uh somehow we've got to have some type of partnership and some type of way to to effectively do exactly as you're saying jim because there are some games i mean uh there there are some games that are uh ripoffs of other games that are fun to play but hey if you want these extra levels guess what <laughs> Next to uh, where Ankit is, um, Pakistan just recently 
Yeah, I think it was exactly what Julian was talking about. I mean, the tough part is the banning. There are, I, I agree with a lot of the bands, uh, you know, dealing with, you know, the immoral stuff that, you know, may happen and, and stuff like that. But it also gets into a play where uh, it, 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 it could stifle that creativity. But of course, again, that becomes a balancing act. Um, it, it, because the, the whole argument that developers and that a lot of the gaming community have is that games should be viewed as art more so and, and that could help the situation because that people just like Julian was talking about, honestly, where we have to get over the idea of a game being a waste of time of, of just uh, influencing you so bad that it's making you go out and do this. Well, there are, there are so many advantages to video games. Um, I mean, it, it is a great escape. It helps people, especially in times like today where you, you're trying to find that social interaction. Well, you know what? There, that's always been in these games like Fortnite and, and, and the games uh, like League of Legends and so on and so forth where you're playing against somebody that's across the globe that you're now best buddies with. Now I'm stuck inside because of the virus that's outside. But guess what I can still do? I can still play with my best friend and talk with my best friend. That's that social interaction that games can have. Um, so what do you guys think of, of the negatives of playing? So for instance, we can look at things like, I know I like to describe Facebook as a video game just because it's a kind of funny way of looking at things. But you know, whenever it comes to things like social media or lots of other video games, you can have game addiction and these sorts of things can lead to negatives. So I think that we could probably all agree on some of the negatives that we consider undesirable. And I think it would be easier to think in terms of a kind of legislation that we could at least start by, you know, raising the floor, by reducing some of the negative impacts. And if we could do it in a way where we can reduce the negative impacts but maintain the openness, maybe that would be better. So that could be a potential benefit of legislation would be some kind of system to, I guess you could say, uh, help people prevent themselves from being swept into some of these capitalistic strategies. Because that's what a loot box yeah. is. It's basically a game company being forced to earn money or the business is going to die. So what else are they supposed to do? And, you know, it's not like there's anybody that cares enough about their business or their mission. So maybe if people cared enough about their mission to finance some, you know, to provide at least enough sustenance where they wouldn't have to include these loot boxes, then that could be a kind of program that could maybe raise the floor without uh, limiting the creativity. But then, you know, it gets into the question of, well, why does this particular format deserve extra funding? Is it just because it's a form of art? Or what about these other things like movies and things like that? So, uh, yeah, I guess it really just, it's so difficult to get into. We almost would have to describe the value of every piece of art in terms of what it represented and what it could really contribute to society. And it just opens up such a can of worms that uh, it could be worth opening. Definitely could be worth opening. And I think that opening it could actually do more good than just what could be done in the video game industry. I think that this kind of objectivity would help people who, for instance, might be more scientifically minded to appreciate the value of artistic contributions you know, just to the human uh, pantheon, so to speak. So I think that could be an interesting way, is if we just focus on removing the negatives, but still having enough tolerance for different views and, you know, people who might want to make fun of us and respecting their freedom of speech and all that to allow them to exercise their, their creative freedom. What do you guys think of that? I think that's a great idea, and I also think that we don't want to stifle creativity, but we also want to protect the consumer. And so some type of labeling, I'm not so sure we want to legislate and say you cannot do this or you can't do this or we'll fund this or we won't fund that, but we should let the market decide what's fun. And But we should also tell the consumer uh, by a, some, some sort of uh, label or some sort of uh, uh, warning sticker or, you know, like in a cigarette, you know, if you smoke cigarettes, you might have cancer. You know, <clears throat> if you play this game, you might be subject to wa watching some violence that you might want your kids watching. You know, maybe something that is just, uh, just so, a warning, just a, some, you know, category. So, a so there is... Print, a bit less fine print when you have, like, a mature video game and something that says, please play responsibly. So there is that, but I'd be more so inclined to focus on the the capitalist capitalistic side 
where that's where the advantage and the negatives really come into play. Um, the, the video game addiction, I think we overstress that because, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's not as prevalent as, you know, it's talked about or it's, it's viewed in your, your, your non-gaming individual where people say, well, oh my goodness. Uh, for example, when, whenever a, uh, well, since one has happened, it's sad to say one has happened pretty much every day until COVID hit. And then we didn't have one because school shut down. But when every time a school shooting or something happens, the first thing they go to is what video games did it. It's not true because, (laughs) you know, you have other things that are there that are influencing this child and that are being missed by this child or this adult video games really isn't there as the focus. They didn't go and say, I want to go and do this because the video game told me something happened to that individual that made them go to that posit to that place to do whatever they did. It wasn't warning signs. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I think that we should focus, especially with video games, because if we begin to understand and, and look at it through art, through education and understand if we talk to, for example, Roblox, Roblox is a beautiful game. Tons of kids are playing it. And you know what you can do in Roblox, build your own world, understand how to create a game and develop and program. If you can talk to a child and challenge them to, Hey, I want you in my uh, STEM class to create a world where, uh, you know, uh, the, I want you to remake your city in Roblox. Why can't you do that? That's education. That's teaching the kid about the, the place that he lives. I want you to, uh, create a beautiful, uh, uh, monument to, uh, to Paris as an exchange for, you know, how they gave us the statue of Liberty. Let's go ahead and see if we can do the same back. And how would you come up with, so you can educate through video games and talk to kids that way. And I think the more we stress that, Oh, well, the games are bad. Games are bad. We alienate those kids. And if we want to protect them, we've got to make sure that on the inside of the game, that's why I say getting back to the capitalistic side, where game developers are not able to run rampant and just take money and give you no real product or no, nothing on the end game. And this is why I, I will always compliment what Epic has done with Fortnite. They have given, they have created a great V buck system where the kid or the individual is excited about the skin, the dance, it gives them some way to to achieve that as well as, okay, well, if I pay my 10 bucks for this, then I am excited and satisfied with this um, rather than. Quick interjection. I just want to touch on part of the brilliance of how Epic actually did that because I think it's so interesting. So they have a cycling menu of in-game purchases where basically new things are made by content creators, including, you know, just random people and even some more skilled artists. And then those are available in the game. And so as a result, it doesn't just encourage players to play. It also stimulates the economy. And uh, something I've realized lately is that the economy wants you to stimulate it. And if you can create some force that will stimulate the economy, there will just be a kind of gravity that will bring more resources into account. So I think that that's partially how Epic was able to do it. They were able to bring in the creativity of so many people and then, you know, Whichever things are good, they make it. And if people buy it, they buy it. And then whenever that happens, people get, you know, even more involved in the culture. And it's basically exponential. Yeah. I think that is a major part of this. And, you know, also Fortnite has a lot of uh, musicians who will have, like, big game concerts and things like this. So basically, by shifting other parts of the economy that almost seem unrelated, they were able to expand their power base in a very strategic kind of way. And so now, for instance, when I listen to Travis Scott, it makes me think of Fortnite and vice versa as a result of uh, just, you know, that particular collaboration. And that's how it goes. But, yeah, I don't really know of any other games that have allowed that level of openness. And maybe that's why it's risen to the heights that it has. Well, Minecraft has. Okay. Well, hey, Minecraft is also pretty high up the list. Yeah. Yeah. And can you have any? So, uh, so I, I had just had a different view with 
terms of uh, gaming because what i understand that uh, gamers are like call followers and then people who are in the industry they know about the gaming otherwise if you ask anyone else they don't know anything about it so i think it's something which is followed by a lot of people around the world but not all of the games i think one of the uh, second most popular games after turtles in india is candy crush people still play yes. candy crush and then they just have a hard time but what uh, what i wanted to do i mean if i get a funding from silicon valley i would uh, play a lot of studios around the world and uh, from the gamers then uh, which is a closed inside box i want gamers to go out and play in the in the open air basically and i wanted to create a lot of content with vr and ar so that uh, people can play games and uh, still uh, do their own work so so let's say example if i am uh, if i am at the airport and i have like uh, seven hours of play out so what i'll do i'll just roam around at the airport but i will like to sit on at the airport play a game and then while playing the game i will order all my food and the food will come at my uh, gaming console and i'll have uh, i can access everything while sitting at the airport itself so it's like an ar vr with a gaming thing and i will just control everything uh, i mean sitting there why will i go around there and roam around here and there and then and then with gaming it's kind of a closed uh, uh, pod uh, where you can relax you can sleep and you can play your game and you can pass the time and my idea of gaming is this that uh, why i don't play games is it's most about addiction and i, I wanted to spend uh, productive time to something else not for games i enjoy game but i don't play that much but uh, on the other hand i wanted to produce a lot of learning games which will create a lot of learning for or maybe create some skills for the society or else we can see a lot of ads on youtube while uh, i mean watching youtube and things like that what i wanted to do is that uh, while watching those ads i have that power to order a lot of uh, or maybe try to do some engagements uh, while playing games so so uh, so the next example is that uh, you are waiting at the doctor's clinic for like uh, one hour and then you don't have you don't know what to do but if i help uh, if i have some kind of a health game which will enable my health or which will teach me how to maintain your health and then that game will give me some rewards as well that will beneficial for me and for the gamers as well so i just wanted to uh, i mean create some kind of integration uh, with the offline society and the online society and then create an engagement so that uh, every person can benefit out of it and then you can create a lot of analytics and data as well and that you can use it at that amount of time on the other hand uh, the most important uh, aspect which i don't like about the gamers is that every gamer have a different gaming name or a, a profile on star when they play different games and then uh, it's difficult to vertically capture anyone so suppose if i want to capture like anyone suppose jetobi i want to capture jetobi but jetobi playing uh, jetobi in tetris but uh, if he plays some other game he changes the name and i don't I, it's difficult to track that person according to me according to me uh, if we wanted to create some kind of a, a world council and identity i mean you can have a different uh, virtual avatar but uh, their avatar is like a facebook profile i mean you don't have to share your personal thing but uh, then you are playing with the same profile uh, so that we can at least uh, i mean go and uh, grab that person whenever we can and why i am talking for that because 5g and because a lot of security issues it's difficult to track those people and then everything is enabled online i mean if i talk to you if i play a game with you as a different person it's so, easy for you to track me because we play games every day so just to have some kind of security maybe we should have a single avatar or maybe multiple avatar or you can buy or book your avatar so that you will have your own brand or something like that uh, which will allow you to make games and also on the other hand with that i mean like uh, we have a lot of ratings in chess uh, i mean Jim knows about uh, the rating thing, but there is no rating in games. I mean, there is a rating like uh, if you play Tetris, you have this rating. If you play some other game, you have this rating. But if we have a universal rating with gamers as well, that will also help the uh, so industry. So, a universal gaming score will just basically be an IQ score at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah. That, I mean, that's kind of what that would translate into. Uh, yeah. What the, this is really interesting to me because what it makes me think of a situation that could address this is almost a kind of virtual reality replacement so, for a lot of the uh, constructs in society. So for instance, whenever we reach a point where we'll have, you know, virtual reality and maybe we'll have a virtual office where we'll all be working from home but it'll seem like we're all in an office together. If this kind of world was to be integrated not just on the business to business level but on a municipal level or even a national or even a global level, then we could actually just recreate the earth basically. And then once you recreate the earth, Every person is just a, you know, they all have so, their unique identifier again in some sense. So in terms of that, there is, again, there is that already. Um, 
so Rocket League. If you're playing Rocket League, you're right. That wherever you play it, that's your name, regardless. Um, and can I don't think that it's possible to do the what you're talking about because if I am, if I choose because the thing about gamers is it, it's all it's all about individuality and having that power of that individuality. And if I choose a name in Rocket League and then I want to go and play Fortnite, if that name is taken. I can't just take that name. Um, so you can still, again, you can. So for example, if you play on Steam and all of your games on Steam, you'll be able to find that name on Steam. But if I, again, there are different platforms. There's not a universal platform across across if everything. If there was one, people would get out of it. So yes. Uh, well, there's, uh, they... Yeah. Well, for instance, let's take something like online poker, Texas Hold'em. So, uh, say you have an individual who just goes and takes out a, you know, really large business loan, and then they actually create a bunch of different email identities, and then they go into an online Texas Hold'em, where basically it's just them versus one person, even though the entire table is full. And, uh, you know, it's like maybe they'll have all these other things that you just can't track. Maybe they'll have calculators running. Maybe they'll have other people in the room giving them advice. Maybe they'll be on the phone with some of their, you know, friends with expertise. So at the end of the day, when I look at this with the Texas Hold'em case, it almost becomes, becomes a question of asking, well, how can we actually force people to adhere to these things? And that's really when the answer is just uh, glaring. It seems that we can't. Well, it will happen, people will be able to get around it. And so and, based on that, maybe it almost makes it futile. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree that it would be futile, but in a sense, it's already there again. I mean, but you're taking, if I want to play Fortnite and be uh, Superman, uh, Superman who watches goats uh, in Fortnite, and in Rocket League, I want to be Superman who watches cars then that takes away that individuality. And I think a lot of people, the gamers themselves, enjoy being able to uh, name themselves however. For example, in even running the Discord sites that I have, uh, there are individuals that use a different name for Discord than they do for their Epic account. Why? Because it's fun. It's another way of having a, uh, what they call their skins or an individuality P or an individual piece that's me. It gives me power. I, really I can, and so that's what. That's that's the big thing about uh, uh, online gaming is it's social. It's 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 powerful. It's it, it, it. I mean, it's that true self embodiment of who I am and what I want to be, and I can't be judged. Even though online, you know, sadly you're judged a lot, <laughs> which is crazy. But the thing is, I have power to change it. And I can change it. Oh, I like this name, so I can change it tomorrow. I can be so. Restrictions to the names, though. Like, for instance, people do still have to have separate names. Whereas, yes. I remember back in the day on RuneScape, you could just open a Chrome tab, uh, in one, and then <laughs> yeah. you could just plug in your other account, and then you'll have you know two people running around, and you're actually controlling both. So, in that sense, it's uh, it seems I think there will be some form of uh, control over the whole naming thing. So it's just a matter of deciding what's really fair and what's really desirable. But yeah, ultimately the games will be separate and people will always find ways to break away. So it is kind of impossible to expect there to be this consistency, especially because, uh, if the consistency was to be tracked, it would have to be tracked in such an expensive way because otherwise if I could just find out Jatobi's name and then I could go and make an account with that name yep. and then he would be able to make an account because the name would already be taken, for instance. And so then if he wanted to dispute the identity, then, you know, that would just be a completely uh, another process entirely. So, yeah, there would be a lot that would go into something like that, that's for sure. But I still think that there is potential in the fact that moving towards this kind of virtualized society, like what I was describing in response to Ankit, it does give us the ability to free ourselves from exposure to pathogens. So basically, we won't have to go out into the environment as much, and that could actually be bad. I mean, there are times when, of course, that'll be good. If somebody is the one who should be quarantined away, it's especially good. But at the same time, you don't want to just uh, 
You don't want your immune system to be so weak that the slightest inoculation will just ruin you. So I think in many senses it might even be good that there is this kind of friction between nations uh, and between different ideologies trying to decide what is good. Maybe it's better that way. And then um, over time, you know, I think it, it will slowly bleed out. Because I think that, again, the gaming industry is one of the last bastions of objective measurement of, I guess you could say, people's abilities and where they are. And it's also one of the only places where you can get consistency in a heavy hand. You know, a lot of places will just give you a trophy now for something that might not necessarily be as deserving. And in many ways, that could actually confuse uh, a developing person. So, you know, the gaming industry... Are you saying that it's the final frontier? (laughs) (laughs) Gone! Uh, to answer your first question, have you seen Madden football? Have you seen NBA 2K, any of them? Or even going way back <laughs> to any sports video game? There was actually a, a game called uh, Sunset Overdrive that had, I think it was Pepsi on the inside of it. Yeah, they're, they're using, they'll use in-game advertisements if it's, you know, I mean, if they can pay for it. And they can make it work. Yeah. I mean, it's there. For example, Fortnite. <laughs> Have you seen every season of Fortnite? They they just released the whole Marvel season. Guess what? Uh, guess what? Uh, comes out. Matter of fact, next week, there is a Marvel game that comes out. There's also the Marvel Studios stuff that's happening right now. Sadly, of course, we had, the is- it had uh, Chadwick Boseman pass away. But even still... There's tons and tons of advertisement that goes on in video games. And I mean, they do it in a slicker way than they do it on TV or in movies where they hold up a bottle and say, Hey, guess what I got? But no, it's, it's definitely there. Um, the game of the week this week is it's, it was free on the Epic game store, but then, you know, I mean, it moved past it. It's actually free on steam, the beta version for some odd reason, it's tr- I don't know why. This game is for anybody under the sun, from kids uh, all the way to adults. It's a uh, fun game where it's called Total Reliable Delivery Service. It's a teamwork game. It's not a competitive game. Uh, you have to work together just to deliver packages. You can use the controller if you've got a controller, or you can use... Um, the uh the keyboard all you do is you join they drop you in as a character and (laughs) yep all you do is you pick up packages and you deliver them and it's up to four players uh there is no real um there's not much chatting that happens there can be but no you're just running around just picking up packages and dropping them off and it's very silly. As you see, there's an explosion. Nobody can die. So <laughs> you can jump off any building you want to and land, get up and climb up the building again. You can uh, play with your friends, uh, you fly in a helicopter, jump off the top of the helicopter into the ocean. Not stuff you can do in real life. But yeah, that's all you do. Yeah. Change in settings. It's change in settings. So, for example, uh, they this is the training part. I got to go over here. I have to grab uh, the camera is funky. So now I got to pick up the package. I drag the package over here. Now I just got to pick up the package. Yep, load it in there. I'm getting dizzy. 
<laughs> but this is all you do. When you, it's much better. It's much more fun when you play with a group of people, just because all you're doing is arguing. Can you get in the car? Stop. Just get in the car. <laughs> and then you break the packages, and then you just get so frustrated. You're like, okay, well, we'll just take this helicopter and just fly up to wherever we can go. <laughs> so there's no package up there so let me run down here so yeah they'll tell you okay there's this box here i gotta grab the box and driving is horrible <laughs> okay load it in there oh Just a few, just a little bit. Ah! But yeah, this is all you do the whole time. <laughs> I'm relaxing. <laughs> Now I gotta jump in here and pick up the package. <laughs> I plan out a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Brown delivers. The funniest thing is that uh, uh, Fortnite. One of the, uh, you know, has one of the largest player bases. You know what you're doing? You're building. You're working. League of Legends. You know what you're doing? <laughs> you're just trying to protect your little yard so other people don't destroy it. Yep. Get to deliver to the mountains. Uh, right now, I don't know where I'm taking this one. Oh, I just lost it. <laughs> and like I said, playing it with, with people, this is the whole time you're trying to sit here and load it on and somebody can't load it on and then they start messing with you and taking off. Why don't you just drive backwards? Oops. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and drop it off. Hopefully. That would be easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a second. I'm not supposed to deliver it there. Jim, you see where I gotta go? Wow! <laughs> I'm supposed to take it up there to the uh, ski resort. Oh no, they knocked over my. <laughs> oh, they knocked over my stuff. Yeah, I gotta go up to the ski resort. You know what this makes me wonder? Well, I guess we're nearing the end, so here's a question for you guys. What do you think are some types of jobs that can benefit from these yeah, skills that people yeah, yeah. enjoy exercising oh, so much you. in these jobs-based games? Because, you know, we see this one last week. We saw the game, uh, what was it, Wilmont Warehouse, right? And in Minecraft, it's about placing blocks. Tetris, it's about placing blocks. It seems that that's just a thing that people like doing. Where can we use these skills? Software development is one thing that comes to mind. Or I guess like the, uh, electronics engineering. Yeah. I've been in. I think, I mean, it, it's a great question. And I think, honestly, you could probably use these skills anywhere from spatial recognition. Um, when you're building a PC, um. you've got to figure out, you know, uh, the, ooh, I'm under the truck now. Let's see. Uh, 
Ah! I dropped the package. I gotta go back and get it. Yeah, I never put Tetris expert on my uh my app job application. <laughs> uh, exactly. But, you know, now looking back, maybe you should at least compared to other yeah, games. Yeah, fine. Why did I die? Well, I mean, if you got quits on game on your resume, and I don't know that it's going to help you, because, I mean, I can say I'm a real good friends expert, and, uh, that might help me with the girl of the job, but then again, it might not. Well, that's what your words per minute count actually is. Your resume is just a bunch of scores from specific games that are considered relevant to the job. So if these games actually do teach relevant skills, they should carry over as far as I can tell. Well, if I was hiring Julian, I would be asking which games he plays. And then I would be judging him by that. That's interesting. Plugging his profile. That's really yeah, interesting. We have, uh, we, we have a funded for social behavior. There, uh, there are a lot of tools available, and people uh, just uh, put your profile and then they'll get to know your uh, social media behavior. And based on that, uh, they hire people. So that can help uh, uh, with the gamer profile as well. And then uh, once I know uh, what your game to play, I will be able to understand what kind of profile or character to carry or uh, what you do with I think uh, it's easy to uh, capture, but uh, uh, I will come back to uh, what I was saying is that uh, I think uh, it's all about ecosystem and what kind of ecosystem the studios bring up. And that ecosystem will take you uh, for a long period of, uh, I mean, uh, maybe uh, community or members or uh, whatever you say. Hey, uh, yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, also, I mean, I wanted to be, uh, I mean, we know about uh, we work in co-working space, but uh, there is no gaming uh, co-working uh, uh, in the world right now. And uh, if we try to create a lot of infrastructure for gamers and uh, introduce gamers to uh, those people who don't play games, I think they will just be accepted and uh, work it out accordingly because they are pros and then there are people who are like, uh, they don't know anything. So there is no middle who, who will just jump out and help those people to join the pro uh, community or maybe join the gamers and something like that. So uh, I think uh, there is a lot of work required on the other side of the uh, I've got to ask you a question. The person that you're driving with, did they go to the Markley School of Driving? Because as we all know, I don't drive, so <laughs> they're driving and I think they went to the Markley School of Driving. Uh, the character was based on you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking like the SETI project? The SETI project? How they had, uh, well, there was um, where you could load on an application onto your computer and it was supposed to be doing calculations to figure out where life was or uh, stuff in space. The whole, uh, what was it? I cannot remember the acronym. And can, can you remember it? Uh There are. It definitely, it definitely shows you how to live your life, but um, I do have to make a comment on this game, though, because he's uh, and the person dropped from the hot air balloon with a parachute. So I see this girl like, wait a minute, don't you need a parachute in this game? <laughs> no! Parachute! 
parachutes are overrated. <laughs> And see, that's why I say, like, this game is perfect for any age group. It's just a silly game. Kids play it. Kids will run around doing whatever they want to. Oops. I didn't mean to blow it in plane. <laughs> but yeah. That is this game. That is all this game is. The ambulance just drove by and I just blew up. <laughs> I mean, it is great. Once I found it, I mean, like I said, you can put kids on this for hours, especially them with their friends. Just sit there and play. Just have fun. I'm a, f I'm a fan of modders. For me, I'm a fan of modders because if you take a game like Skyrim, Skyrim has lived in imp Skyrim and all the uh, Elder Scrolls games and a few of the others are out there. Um, but those have lived on because of modders. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's a beautiful thing because, honestly, it's it's a great teaching tool. Again, um, if we can use those way uh, those tools, like there are games that will not ever have like a modder come in because then it cracks into the code and then you get into cheating. But games like Elder Scrolls and other RPGs that are out there that you can do some stuff with that allow kids to learn and grow from that. I'm all for modding. Um, there are some levels of um, going back to Skyrim. Uh, but yeah, there are just different levels that are out there that are created because of modders. Counter-Strike Go uh, has some levels that people created because they like the maps. So you know what we're going to play? We're going to play the map that I created. Fortnite actually did that. You can create... Uh, there's a, a, an option called Zone Wars. Uh, you can create levels and maps for Zone Wars for you and your buddies to come in and play that particular level or even monetize it by saying, hey, look, I'll create you and your tournament a level uh, and all you got to do is pay me this money. I'll go ahead and put in the, 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 the skins, everything that you need. All you need to do is just load into this map. So, I mean, it, I love modders because it, it opens up doors. It's another way for people to use their skills, especially those kids that are sitting here playing the video games a lot. They know the ins and outs of it. They're probably going to do better creating a modification to the game than the developer who created it. Because again, it goes back to the, uh, if you look at it in, in, in musically, for example, Mark, uh, how many remixes or samples have, uh, has, uh, Sean Puffy Combs lift off of. <laughs> I mean, any modern musician samples some. So they're not taking the original. They're actually modifying the actual song to make it better for the the, the people of today, for example, or their... Legislation that the hacker is trying to respond to, which actually develops. Oh, what, do you guys, what do you guys think? Should we have a kind of uh, legislation, maybe, and then still encourage people to try to get around it? Or do you think that we should just uh, disencourage it entirely, discourage it? So there's, that goes into the nuance of hacking is different from modding. Hacking, yeah. you're, you, it's all about intent. Uh, you know, you have a hacker it who has necessarily, right? yeah. necessarily mean like uh, stealing information. It could just be putting together a, a 
solution that wasn't anticipated or expected. And I think that's where you got to come up with the idea of, of, ah, this street had the pothole knock me over. A bubble. A bubble. I care. Uh, the game of the week right now is Total Reliability or Total Reliable Delivery Service. Um, like I said, it's a great game for people to play, uh, especially to get kids on. If I remember, it's not uh, fourteen, no, nineteen bucks on the Epic Store. Uh, no, I'm sorry, fourteen bucks on the Epic Store. It's free on beta on Steam, but then it goes to uh, nine, uh, fourteen bucks on the Steam Store as well. Mark, I should have. Mark, I should have sent you Neon Beats. Oops. I should have sent you Neon Beats because of the music. Tomorrow on Medical Friday only on IBMP. 